transparency uh, guidelines. These are for grants and publishers primarily. Uh, my name is Anita Vandrovsky. I am at the Department of Neuroscience and I also lead a company called SciCrunch Inc. Um, so that is my conflict of interest statement. Um, first of all, I just want to get through <clears throat> a few definitions. Uh, this is still a very new field. There are still very new ideas going on here. So we like to define some of these things um, so that we're all on the same page. When I talk about transparency, it is the ability of information to be shared and viewed within a particular paper. So transparency is something that everyone can strive for and, and attain. Um, rigor and methods reproducibility. So uh, a lot of the times when I refer to rigor, I'm really talking about methods reproducibility. Can you actually do the same method as exactly as possible with the same data and tools and um, can you do that process? And that is the process of uh, methods reproducibility. I also think about results reproducibility and it's the um, production of, uh, of new data uh, using the same method and getting actually the same result. There's something called inferential reproducibility. So this is the making of knowledge claims. So this is um, essentially doing a different experiment um, but actually getting a similar result. And um, that is a, a different kind of reproducibility. There is an idea of robustness. So if I do an experiment and that experiment is robust, it means that most people, even undergraduates, for example, in a laboratory, would get um, the same experimental outcome generally as the original study got. And that is a robust finding. And there are, of course, things that can't be done outside of individual labs. It doesn't mean they're wrong, but they're not robust. And then there's the concept of generalizability. So the persistence of an effect in settings different from and outside of an experimental framework. So when we talk about generalizability, we're starting to get into really a scientific robust finding that can be um, ascertained using many different kinds of methods in many different labs. Again, the kinds of experiments that um, we're looking for in, for example, in an undergraduate um, experimental design, because those, uh, those new scientists are going to create um, uh, all sorts of different variables that they're not even uh, uh, certain about. Okay, so why are we talking about transparency, rigor, and uh, results reproducibility, and then finally generalizability? Our colleagues at uh, the Camarades uh, Center uh, actually did a study in which they looked at a thousand different in vitro and in vivo interventions for experimental stroke. So we know that there are strokes out there uh, and there are lots of people studying stroke. Um, in fact, there are over a thousand interventions over about this 10 year period that have been published, both of them in vitro and in vivo, so in the animal and in, um, in cell lines, for example. Um, now 600 of these were actually tested in vivo. Um, 374 were shown to be effective in vivo. So this is something that's happening in an animal where there is a, a, a positive intervention for stroke. 97 of these interventions were tested in people in a clinical trial. And unfortunately, only one was effective over this 10 year period of study. In the same period, there were two um, other interventions that actually did not come through this pipeline. Now, in Silicon Valley, there is a mantra, fail early, fail often. And this is unfortunately not an example of this mantra, right? We have, in fact, um, something like fail late and fail expensive is, is the mantra of this particular um, uh, subject. So, now I'm gonna tell you 
about a psychologist. This psychologist um, wanted to do a five-day experiment in rats, um, and he wanted to do this experiment in an elevated T maze. Now, an elevated T maze is very simple. There's a dark arm and a, a bright arm, and one of these arms, in this case, the dark arm, was always reinforced with food. So you start the, the, the rat, um, you time how long it takes them to find the food. And uh, he gave these 12 graduate students in psychology um, basically two groups of rats. I uh, called them maze bright and maze dull. And uh, he asked them to go ahead and do this five-day experiment to help him out. Um, and the, um, the arms were alternating either, uh, you know, either the, uh, the left or the right were, um, uh, were the dark arms. And so they were supposed to just test how long it takes for these rats to run the maze. And so they were able to generate this data. And this is the average data for the five-day experiment. So you can see that the maze bright rats are doing much, much better. Uh, they start off, uh, you know, with a, with a much better result uh, than, than maize dull ones are not doing quite as well. And you can see that that sort of continues throughout the five days, you know, a little bit more and a little bit less there. Um, both are learning, you can see, but the maize bright animals are actually learning uh, much faster. So why am I talking about this? Well, because what happened then was that there was a terrible tragedy. Uh, the paper was published, and if you read the, um, the title of that paper, which is The Effect of Experimenter Bias on the Performance of the Albino Rat, you will understand that these 12 graduate students were not, in fact, the experimenters, but the experimentees. Um, what the graduate students, well-meaning graduate students, demonstrated very well in 1963 is that they are able to bias this particular experiment to say what the, um, what the PI, what the professor wanted the experiment to say. And all he said is that there are two groups of rats, one maze bright and one maze dull. The next part of, the, um, of this exercise will be to figure out what is a good sample size to use um, and whether or not that's actually being, um, uh, being addressed by uh, the paper that you care about. So sample sizes have to do with small underpowered studies. How do you know that a, a, a study is underpowered or too small? And what is the problem with small study? If you have an example of one person doing something, um, it just, generally tends to not be accurate for a larger population. Small underpowered studies will give you more false positives, they'll give you more false negative results. Um, there is a reduced predictive value because you have much too small of a population. Um, the probability that a positive research finding actually reflects a true effect in a particular population is highly reduced. Then there's something called the winner's curse. So if I see something once, I am lucky I have now figured something out. Well, the problem is that this is actually a curse. The um, lucky scientist who makes that, that first discovery, now they have biased themselves into thinking that they know what's actually going on instead of looking back at all of the evidence to figure out that um, you know that actually something uh, maybe has not happened in the way that the scientist thought when looking at the first one or two or three samples. So, um, and this again can bias the scientist moving forward in that study into thinking they have what they uh, they have uh, more than than what they have. So, um, the way that we get around. Um, figuring out how much predictive power we actually need uh, is to do a calculation. This is a simple statistical calculation called the power calculation. If you look at this formula, 
It is roughly um, the um, it is roughly a t-test turned upside down. Um, literally, you can derive the power formula from the t-test formula. And if you are unsure in your studies, in your experiments, how to do a power calculation properly, there are wonderful people, um, usually in the departments of math and statistics. Uh, there's the nice building on campus, which we will never go to again, I suspect. Um, <laughs> The, um, but there are people that are at all major universities called statisticians on call. You can basically go to the math department or you can virtually go to the math department and you can ask one of these people to please help you with your statistics. And they are, you know, they actually have a, a position there. It's a rotating position at, at every major university that I have ever uh, gone to and, and uh, given this talk at that will help you with your statistics. So um, the next thing I wanted to tell you about is the garden of forking paths, right? Now this particular um, fallacy is something that we all suffer from in research labs. So we might have a hypothesis and it starts here. And this hypothesis uh, for this particular example is handedness um, in ADHD, right? That there is a difference in handedness um, levels of uh, ADHD patients. And the first study that um, might happen basically leads us down a path to a second study and a third study and a fourth study and a fifth study, right? <clears throat> and the problem is, and this is, this is actually not a problem. This is how all studies happen because you see something and you follow it up. You see some other result and you follow it up with different experiments and different subjects. Now, statistical power to detect a false result is typically adjusted here at the final study. It is not adjusted for all of these um, forking paths that happened beforehand. So a lot of studies which are preliminary, actually when they do set up their statistical, um, their statistical tests, they set it up only for this portion of this. And they don't set it up for all of the, um, the other studies that had gone on beforehand in that same line of reasoning. So this is a perfect example of a preliminary study. And a preliminary study could be really good, but it has to be followed up. Okay, so um, the next thing that actually um, is a rigor criteria, which is um, sex as a biological variable. Um, and sex, actually, remarkably enough, we have, um, we have both males and females in society. Um, but sex affects cell physiology, metabolism, and many other biological functions. It affects symptoms, manifestations of disease, and actually it affects a lot of responses to treatment. So part of the reason um, why we have a lot of clinical trials failing is actually because of sex. So um, sex is, uh, uh, is absolutely considered in clinical trials as a very important variable. In fact, you have to balance males and females in any clinical study. But in fact, when looking across a whole slew of biology, um, male rodents were used predominantly. So 80% or more of animal studies were actually using only uh, male animals and not female animals. Sometimes they were using male and female animals, but they didn't keep track. So these are all major problems that then affect our ability to generalize a finding that is about a male rodent to a full population of humans. Okay, so taking a look across a lot of different studies. So we've just looked at 15 papers um, across the 15 students. And um, here are some results. Um, again, these are uh, uh, adapted from Shai Silverberg's slide deck. Um, he is one of the um, program uh, people at NIH. 
And um, he looked up, and this, this study is now a little bit old, but these are very difficult to do. Um, so he's again looking at stroke studies, Parkinson's disease studies, and multiple sclerosis-based um, studies. These are all um, things that really should have things like uh, randomization, uh, which we didn't talk about, blinded assessment of outcome, um, and certainly sample size calculation. So in terms of our, our sample of 15 papers, um, we did not have blinding in any of them. Um, but blinding was actually present in about three to 18 percent of these um, of these studies that were looked at before. And um, sample size calculation, we did have a sample size calculation that was a positive value in this particular study. The um, you know 500 uh, papers actually none of them had a sample size calculation. So this is power analysis. It was not done at all in any of these. So um, we're not much better on the sample size calculation. One out of 15 is still a very low percentage, but that is roughly expected. Um, we're actually for the studies that we're looking at, the blinding was actually um, probably a little below this range. Um, but these are things that can be done. Um, in any study. You can certainly do a, a sample size calculation to determine what your predictive uh, power is going to be for, uh, for that particular study. It's, a, you know, it's something that you can do on paper with the help of a, um, of a statistician if needed, um, but it's certainly something that can help a study along. Um, we did a calculation, a set of calculations to figure out if this um, trend is still true. Uh, so the original study, this, this was done in 2007. Um, we just followed this up to go um, from 2007 all the way to 2019. Um, and we looked at the uh, sex as a biological variable. We looked at the number of blinding statements. We also looked at randomization, which we didn't do in this group. We looked at power calculations, um, and then there is something called size score that um, we uh, we basically you know add up whether um, you know they had actually the paper had addressed blinding and sex and randomization and power and um, other factors, which we'll get to a little bit, a little bit later. And we looked at the percentage of papers here that actually address those those different things. So you can see in um, 97, it was about 10% blind or 10% uh, randomization. Um, the, uh, let's see, the red line here was blinding. So it was about eh, three to 4% blinding um, on average. And uh, by the way, this is a, an average of 1.5 million articles. So um, in 2019, that um, that average went way back, way up to 10%, but still 90% of the studies did not actually do a power calculation. 90% of the studies did not blind, and um, less than 40% actually addressed sex. So that is what we're uh, we're kind of seeing also in our um, uh, in our sub sample here. So we're still not doing great at even reporting on sex, which we should be able to at least do. Uh, even in a cell line paper, it might surprise everyone, but cell lines either come from a male or a female patient. Okay, why does this matter? When you uh, look at this as um, Malcolm McLeod did in, again, this is in 2008, this paper's a little bit dated, but again, these are relatively difficult to do. He looked at infarct volume um, for, again, stroke studies. Um, he looked at uh, 11 publications, 29 experiments, 408 animals all together, and he looked at the efficacy of whatever the study's main, um, uh, main uh, intervention was for stroke. And when you did this, for example, blinded conduct of experiment, if, a, if the uh, study reported their experiments in a blinded fashion, what they did is they actually found a smaller effect than if they reported uh, an unblinded study. So this is actually wishful thinking. This is the real effect. 
This is the wishful thinking effect. This is that effect that was demonstrated in 1963 by those 12 graduate students. So um, this is what we want to guard against because there may be a very real effect, but if you're not actually blinding the investigators or at least assessing outcome in a blinded fashion, you're much more likely to be able to fool yourself into thinking that you have an effect that you think you have and you actually don't have either as big of an effect or an effect at all. Um, and stroke is actually not the only kind of uh, study that is affected by this. If you look, I mean, some of these are backwards between the yeses and the noes, but blinded assessment of outcome out here in multiple sclerosis studies, much smaller, um, if, if it's blinded then versus if it's not blinded. Um, if it's blinded in Alzheimer's disease, again, the efficacy of a treatment is much lower, et cetera, et cetera. Same for Parkinson's. Okay, and this is a really funky study. So treating depression with probiotics, aka yogurt. If you blind that study, it turns out that there is absolutely um, uh, no effect <laughs> of yogurt on these uh, on these animals, and uh, if you don't blind the study, then there's actually a big effect. So this is really what we're looking at. We're looking at people fooling themselves into thinking that um, something is the case when it is not. Um, anybody here of pea hacking? If you had. Um, it tends to be bad, right? So what is, what is p-hacking? So when you analyze and reanalyze the data to get the statistics to behave in the way that you want it to behave. And almost all of us, actually I had a great statistics class in graduate school um, where you know the, the professor actually came in and he's, he just threw a bunch of M&Ms on the table. And we were supposed to pick them out, and then we were uh, we were starting to uh, do statistics on uh, on these M and M's, and basically demonstrated to us how you could p hack almost anything. And the, this is very important to understand this concept, because in fact you can do that. You can do a lot of analysis and reanalysis, but if you don't properly control for um, uh, for this, this kind of overuse of statistics to get them to say what you want them to say, then you've got a real problem because your analysis is no longer valid. So it is a very good idea to start out by saying, this is the analysis that I'm going to do. And then you need to stick to that analysis throughout your study and you report on that analysis you might want to go back and reanalyze and look at something else. But the main analysis is the main analysis. That's what should be reported. So um, the uh, American Statistical Association obviously did come out with a statement specifically saying the p-value was never intended to be a, si a substitute for scientific reasoning. So our over, um, our need to kind of over rely on, uh, on statistics is not healthy and it's not healthy for our science. So what we need to do is take a step back and take a look at what is the data trending towards, for example, you don't necessarily need to rely on p-values um, in order to uh, do what you, uh, or ask what you need to ask and, and ascertain the validity of a particular study. And in that vein, um, I would like to bring, bring up an example uh, from the Journal of Serendipitous and Unexpected Results. Um, this, this story kind of starts out this way. Um, there was a, a, a lab where um, the lab was actually looking at, um, you know, a positive or negative affect in patients going uh, undergoing uh, an fMRI scan. And so this fMRI scan happens, they, uh, they're, they're in the scanner, they're looking at, um, you know, happy faces, sad faces, and uh, they're getting these activation foci inside of the brain of patients. <coughs> 
So what happened is one day uh, a postdoc came in uh, with a lovely salmon. They were going to have dinner. Uh, so they were going to eat the salmon. Uh, it was a nice celebration. And so, you know, they're scientists. So what do they do? Obviously, they put the salmon in a scanner and they run through uh, the entire procedure. Um, now, mind you, the salmon is dead, right? But they get a very lovely result. They get an activation in the brain of this dead salmon. So obviously, they had to write this up. And they did. Um, and this uh, particular uh, study actually won the Ig Nobel Award for 2012, which uh, is highly amusing. And I would highly recommend looking at some of those uh, lovely YouTube videos for past um, awardees. But essentially, they won the Neuroscience Prize for demonstrating that brain researchers, by using complicated instruments and simple statistics, can actually see meaningful brain activity even in a dead salmon, which is very, very interesting. So look at your statistics. So um, keeping track of stuff in our methods, that's kind of the next portion of, um, of this talk. A Morris Water Maze. Uh, okay, Morris Water Maze is essentially a big tank of water. It's a swimming pool for a rat or a mouse. And that swimming pool is kind of filled with a um, sort of a milky substance. Usually it is actually uh, uh, milk powder that's in there. And that's just there to make the water really murky so the, um, the animal can't see a hidden platform. Otherwise, they would see the platform and it wouldn't be uh, a learning activity. So there's this pool of water. Think of it as a kiddie pool kind of a thing. Um, it's very murky and somewhere in that kiddie pool there is a little platform where if you drop the, the, uh, the rat or mouse into this particular maze, right, it need, it's going to swim around and it's going to find the platform. Presumably if it learned anything on that first trial, then what happens is um, after a little while they can find the platform faster. All right, clear. Great. Um, so now we've got a question to the group. Anybody feel free to either chat or say anything. What are the kinds of things that you would keep track of? What would you report on in this kind of a study? Um, okay, so one of the things um, that I would actually be very, um, survival, yes. <laughs> well, presumably all of these subjects were able to survive this, this particular experiment. They tend, to, um, they tend to do okay swimming around. But when looked at across multiple studies, looking at water temperature, and one of the things um, that nobody brought up yet, um, and yes, rats can swim. Um, all rats can swim just like dogs. They do doggy paddle or rat paddle or whatever you'd like. Um, pool size. You know, how big is the pool? And the, the really concerning bar here is this unknown, which actually swamps all the other temperatures, right? And the unknown bar for pool size is also the second tallest. So people are not reporting all of the different kinds of things that would be uh, motivating um, for these animals. So, and you can see the difference here is 16 degrees Celsius. That's a pretty cold pool all the way up to 28. That's like a pool in Florida. You're, you know, I might not be very motivated to get out of that particular pool, but that's just me. And then how far did they have to swim generally to find a platform is determined also by the pool size. Okay, so um, that is, yeah, so this is the unknown um, bar. Okay. Now looking at, I know that you're going to go through um, a lot of protocols with the heads of uh, protocols.io. And so I will go through these, these slides really fast, <laughs> but this is always a fun one. This, uh, I, I will have to credit Lenny, um, the head of protocols.io with this particular slide. Um, but this is just a fun interchange that I am certain that you will uh, unfortunately have to experience at some point in your scientific career. <clears throat> So this is a particular scientist who's going, uh, devices were fabricated as previously described in reference eight. He goes back to reference eight, uh, which is a 2015 paper. 
Devices were fabricated as previously described, reference four. Going back to reference four, 2013 paper, fabricated as previously described, 2009 paper, fabricated with conventional methods. Hmm. Right, so these are problems. Okay, so again, I will not go through this, but the, um, uh, the main uh, problem here is that in fact, we give a lot of detail to some aspects of a particular protocol and we give almost no detail in other parts of the protocol. So for example, you know, we're drawing this owl on a particular paper with particular graphite, but then we're just looking at owls and drawing what we saw on paper, right? So protocols.io, which you will hear from next week, is a way for um, people to actually share methodological details before, during, and after publication. So you can do this with any protocol that's in the lab. And if you're going to share it before publishing a paper, you can cite that protocol. Um, you can cite the DOI of the protocol. Um, anybody else in the lab can actually take and fork that protocol. And you'll learn about that again on Monday so that, um, you know, you, they can sit, it, it, uh, there's a, a link made from your protocol to the next person's protocol. They can edit the protocols. Um, and this is just one of those cool things. So here's one protocol um, where one of the steps, the extraction step was, uh, you know, air dry a pellet for two to two minutes. And that's clearly um, wrong because the timer says seven. So you can actually go back and fix that and make it consistent by versioning um, a new product. Okay, so um, now we're gonna go back to our regular papers and we're gonna start talking about reagents. So again, this is in the scope of keeping track of different stuff. And um, the way that I like to think about every scientific paper um, is I like to think of it as a recipe. And reagents are really your ingredients. So here in this lovely recipe pictured above, you have parsley, you have garlic, you have natural oil, you have uh, crushed pepper and all these other things. These are all essentially ingredients. These are the reagents. So this, the first step of making a recipe is figuring out what stuff you need. And then the second part is really figuring out how to put it together to you know, um, make a beautiful dish. Okay, so when we look at step one in practice, so this is from a real paper, it starts off the, uh, the generation of these humanized PK skid mice. Um, so the authors of this particular paper said that these Nod PK skid IL-2 receptor gamma chain null mice were purchased from Jackson Laboratories, right? And so what I've done here is I've actually copied this and I pasted it into the Jackson Laboratory website, trying to find this mouse. And lo and behold, I got actually no results for that. So, um, so what we came up with is roughly half and half results in the, um, in the papers that we looked at. And in fact, when we look across, and this is uh, a study Put, uh, put together by uh, Nicole Vasileski and, um, and a bunch of other people. And they did this. They basically said they went to the paper, they looked at the first reagent and that um, that was an antibody. You could see that about a little bit less than half of the, the papers could be found in the catalog um, where uh, the, uh, the author specified it and half of them could not be found. Now, there's no excuse for this, right? This is an easy piece of information that can be added to a paper, um, which would really help the readers to figure out what it is, what is that ingredient that is being used. About half of cell lines were findable, a little bit less than that. Constructs, knockdown reagents were pretty good. Organisms were pretty good, um, but not as good as they could be. So we certainly want, you know, that there's basically no excuse for, not telling people what you actually used because this is a pretty simple thing. Um, that paper that I started this exercise on, um, the thing is that that particular person actually got back to me, and this is a hypothesis annotation that I, um, I used to, um, 
uh, to make the, the information public on this particular paper. And he said, um, hey, dear Anita, here's a link to the Jackson Labs page where, um, you know, where I got the mice. But why didn't he just put that in the paper? Wouldn't it be just so much easier if I didn't have to email him? And by the way, I have to stress that in the Vasileski paper and in this paper, I actually reached out to that author two days after this paper was published. And in the Vasileski paper, they used um, the most recent issue of the particular journal that they were looking at. So these are all fresh papers. Now imagine going back and thinking about what has, um, what would, which antibody was used in the lab, you know, five years ago. And it would be much, much more difficult. So in this particular case, this non-PK skid mouse, you can see that its official strain nomenclature is actually nod, period, CK, CG, dash, PRKDC, superscript, skid, space, IL2RG, superscript, TM1, WJL slash SZJ strain. So that just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> so obviously what these authors are doing is they're doing a very human activity. They're calling this Bob, or in this case, nod PK skilled IL2. They're not calling it the official uh, mouse nomenclature, but that is the name that you can look up and understand. And if you don't do this, at least reference this. And here is a syntax, the RRID syntax for this mouse that actually a lot of journals use. What does NIH think about this? In fact, the authentication of key biological and or chemical resources is one of the main things that reviewers are supposed to be evaluating whenever they review your grants. So when, they, when you put in a grant um, now, since 2016 or 2017, when this came into, um, into full force, they're going to be, um, the reviewers are asked to look at the premise, the scientific rigor, of the study being proposed, the consideration of relevant biological variables such as sex, and of course the authentication of key biological and chemical resources such as antibodies, cell lines, transgenic organisms. So the first things that you can do is address these things inside of your next paper, right? Because these are things that can be at least addressed um, relatively easily. Okay, so cell lines, antibodies, transgenic uh, organisms, and specialty chemicals, again, are these uh, key resources. Uh, these are things that often vary from lab to lab. And so unlike what we heard, um, you know, the Petri dish, Petri dishes are, I mean, they're, they can vary, but it's usually not the main experimental variable that goes wrong when you have to track down um, if an experiment has not worked but usually the antibody or the cell line, those are things that can really change. Um, and their mishandling or you know, differential handling will definitely affect a lot of experiments. Okay, so what is NIH trying to say with all these guidelines? Well, I think what they're trying to say here is please pay more attention to the methods section. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about contaminated cell lines and otherwise problematic cell lines. Um, this guy's name uh, is, is Christopher Korch, and what he did um, was he asked a lot of his colleagues through jumping up and down, screaming at the top of his lungs, publishing many, many papers, and writing lots of letters um, that in fact used cell lines that he later found were actually um, contaminated with other cell lines. Um, uh, he essentially has been sort of a one-man force, but now he's getting a lot of help um, saying, this is a bad cell line, do not use this, right? And unfortunately, when he was uh, interviewed by science, he said that um, you know, less than 10 corrections have been issued um, to papers, and there are hundreds of thousands of papers. So this is a really bad thing, and you want to be able to know that your cell lines are actually authentic. How can cell lines become contaminated? Well, 
they're living things, right? And when you sneeze around living things, they might get contaminated with your viruses, whatever those viruses are. So proper handling of these things is um, absolutely critical. And there is now an organization which uh, you know is was in part founded by Christopher Korch and many others um, called ICLAC, which is the International Cell Line Authentication Committee. <laughs> Again, rolls off the tongue. Um, but they suggest verifying using sequencing all of the cell lines as they come into the lab. They also um, uh, suggest spot checking any cell line experiment on some schedule during the middle of the experiment because there may be a problem that develops in the lab with those cell lines. And they also um, suggest that you can verify the cell line at the end of the experiment to make sure that it hasn't shifted over to a different cell, to a cell line, that it hasn't been overgrown by something else. And of course, looking at um, mycoplasma contamination would be another uh, portion of this. There are cell lines that you can buy. And let me just say this slowly. There are cell lines that you can buy that are already contaminated. Let that sink in. There are some cell banks that have sold and are potentially continuing to sell cell lines that are already known to be contaminated. There are other cell lines that are called misidentified. And what is that? Um, anybody know that there are, you know, um, that cell lines are actually part of humans, right? Well, you know that humans are misdiagnosed. When a cell line is taken, a diagnosis is written down. It is one type of cancer or it's another type of cancer. But later on, somebody might find, in fact, that that cell line coming from that individual, which was originally um, assessed to have one type of cancer, is actually, actually had a different type of cancer. And why is that important? Well, if you're studying the first kind of cancer versus if you're studying the second kind of cancer, you may want to use a different cell line. Um, so there is a list of these things. There are um, Cellosaurus, which is a, a, a source of cell lines, actually has noted 714 cell lines that are problematic in some way. Either they're contaminated with HeLa cells, they um, could have been misidentified as the wrong kind of cancer by the original doctor, and some people still believe that that's actually the same, um, that's the cell line. Um, so how do you get around this? You're not going to memorize 714 things um, and then not buy those. Well, it turns out that there is a database that will help you. And um, that database is being reflected at our site, um, at the RRID site. Um, and also it's all reflected on DKNet. So this is where we can, uh, we can find this information. So um, the people who know about these problematic cell lines will actually make this. And I think on DKNet, this is, um, this is red. So take a look at that before you start your experiment with a particular cell line. In fact, the cell line that I was trying to look up um, is one of those misidentified cell lines. It was originally thought to be a hepatocarcinoma. It's actually a hepatocytoma. Still a liver cell, still a liver cancer, but a different one. And if you're going to be um, staking your career and studying one of those two diseases, you might as well know which cell line you're using. So <clears throat> we've looked at this, um, again, with about 150,000 uh, papers uh, that have used cell lines. And we just looked um, uh, last year at how many papers actually contain at least one of the problematic, the so-called problematic cell lines. Um, and it turned out to be that about 16% of papers that use cell lines um, are using one of these problematic cell lines. Now, some of these cell lines might be just fine to use, but you need to be aware of what kind of issue that was brought up and you need to be aware of whether or not that would actually affect your experiment. 
So when we looked at papers where the um, journal um, editors have just basically asked the authors to go in, search, like in the DKNet, but uh, uh, they, they usually send people over to the, R, the main RRID site to go look up their cell lines. And when we looked at the um, percentage of those papers that are actually using one of these problematic cells, <clears throat> it was just over 5%. So this 10% of papers were probably using cell lines incorrectly. Um, most of these, the ones that we looked at, they were, they were uh, almost exclusively on the problematic list and the authors largely were using them properly. So um, these are not small numbers. These are, you know, 150,000 versus 634. These are very large sample sizes. Um, and yes, this was actually significant, although I'm not going to show that here. Okay, so the American Association for Cancer Research and also Nature were very, very interested in this work. And um, they ask all of their authors, um, they're publishing actually to improve reproducibility in their papers by adding these research resource identifiers. This is what some of those looks like. This is what, um, this is just a snippet of the, um, you know, if you're gonna be submitting to Nature, this is uh, a set of directions that you should be following. Um, and of course, how do you find an RID? You um, visit the resource identification portal and <clears throat> go uh, right along the way. So um, a little bit of a, a note about antibodies. Everybody knows that antibodies can be very, very tricky. In fact, uh, in this article um, from, uh, from Munya Baker about the reproducibility crisis, a lot of it can actually be blamed on antibodies. But why are antibodies bad? Well, they can be cross-reactive they can recognize a similar epitope on many different proteins. They can have variability. So this is why the lot number, and I, don't, I didn't see anybody um, that piped up about actually finding the lot number in their paper. Um, lot, num lot to lot variability is a problem with some antibodies and some companies, less so recombinant, less so monoclonal, but certainly for polyclonal antibodies, this is a big problem. The way that you do it is you just report it, report out the catalog number, report out the lot, and report out, of course, the RRID. Um, some antibodies are being used for the wrong application. So when you treat tissues and you treat the protein in different conditions, Western blot is different than immunohistochemistry those proteins are going to be folded in a different way and the same antibody that works for Western may not work for immunohistochemistry and the other way around. So making sure that the application that you're using is appropriate because those proteins do fold and antibodies are very specific to the three-dimensional shape of that protein, um, it will absolutely vary. Okay. But how do we authenticate antibodies? There is a great table here that was put together um, in, this, in this paper. Um, and I will send you this, in, or Koei will send you this paper if, if needed. But this is the validation principle and the validation criteria. And here's a set of, um, uh, a set of uh, um, techniques that this particular um, validation uh, principle or criteria might be effective for. So genetic is sort of the gold standard, but you can also do orthogonal techniques. You can use two different antibodies as an example to try and prove your point, but you have to be very careful um, with that because a lot of companies sell the same antibody under different catalog numbers. So you need to still be careful. Um, IPMS, this is sometimes out of um, uh, out of scope for, for some labs, but it's possible for other labs to do uh, mass spec um, to try and determine whether the antibody is working. But in general, every antibody must be validated for the particular technique that is being used, but a lot of people do not add that information to their papers, even though all good labs do do this um, in order to uh, make sure that their reagents are working the way that they think 
they are working. And uh, I'm not going to ask for hands, but I, uh, I'm assuming that at least some of you have had to, um, the pain of going through weeks of, of um, effort just trying to figure out <coughs> if an antibody is working. Um, okay, so one way you can, one thing you can also do is you can take a look at um, the antibody listings. A lot of them will have things like uh, the ISO standards. Um, so here there are ISO standards that the antibodies were developed under. Um, some antibodies have been discontinued, and when we find that information, we actually note it in the antibody record. So um, in the case where a manufacturer may have had an antibody, but no longer has it, if you, um, and we, we certainly saw that with the paper that I looked at, you know, the, the cell line was no longer offered at that, at that vendor when I looked at it, but that cell line was previously offered at that vendor. So if I went and looked in the antibody, in the, uh, uh, in the RRID portal or in the DKNet, um, I would have been able to find that. Um, we um, also, you know, let people know when we know that there's no validation data or material data sheet available from a particular vendor about the antibody. Um, and there are some external projects, including uh, ENCODE. This is a major project. And that data, um, you know, it's, it may not be, a, a, you know, that the, the, the uh, antibody is actually valid, but in fact, um, you, those are things that can lend information about how somebody else had actually been able to uh, get that antibody to work. Okay. What does an, an RRAD look like? So the proper RID syntax for citing an antibody, a cell line, a mouse, is in fact that there is a company. The company is important, right? There's a catalog number. We ask for the lot number. We don't always get it, but we do ask for the lot number to be um, as, as specific as possible. Uh, in the case of software, this would be version and this persistent unique identifier. And this persistent unique identifier, the RRID, um, is present in, in DKNet. It's also present in the, um, in the uh, RRID portal, obviously, where, uh, where authors are going to get sent by their journals. You are publishing in some of these journals, and now also in science, um, you will be asked to provide RRIDs um, I think the place where they are most visible is in Cell Press because they have a whole special section called the Key Resources Table, and they're just nicely listed in the table where you know the the reagent or resource is listed here by name. There's the place where they got it, and there are the identifiers, and they're actually linked um, at the vendor. Um, at the vendors like MMRC, one of our mouse repositories, you can copy the RID straight. Um, into your uh, into your clipboard and you can paste that into your paper. Um, you can do that by looking at the for the RID at you know um, antibody companies like Biolegend or Thermo Fisher. Um, Cellosaurus does the same thing. This is how you cite this particular uh, cell line. Notice that this one is contaminated. Um, this is how you cite it. This is what you would put into your paper. Okay. Um, some RFAs for different grants do also specifically say that RIDs should be used when creating new resources. And this is what an eLife paper looks like. And this is one of those mice. So this is a mouse that was found um, and written about in this paper from eLife. And you can see that this is linked. So if you click on that, you will actually go through uh, a resolving service and you will end up on the mouse page. Now, that is what that first author that I told you about should have done to be able to be very explicit about what mouse he used exactly and using these links and resolver services that are being put in place by the journals. This is not your job. This is the journal's job. Um, then you can, your readers will be able to end up in the right, um, at the right place to find that, um, that resource or that reagent. Uh, and this is just something fun 
that we were able to do. So um, we're able to actually look at all the different journals <coughs> from again, 1997 to 2019, looking at um, the average of all journals in terms of this blue line. Um, this is what percentage of antibodies were actually findable, which means largely what percentage had a catalog number associated. And you can see that here in 97, it was abysmal, kind of in the 10% range, like we, we now have with blinding. But just over the last few years, the, um, the average has actually risen. So we're, we're getting much closer to um, hitting the 50% mark. So half of all the papers, um, eh, not quite yet, but nearly half of all the papers now have some kind of a catalog number. Um, associated with at least their antibodies. Um, and if you have to publish in some place like eLife or Cell, then uh, that number is much, much, much higher. And so um, the, the take home message from this that I would love for you to take home is to put RIDs into your next paper. And when you become a reviewer um, for both grants and also papers that you review and pay attention to the methods because the methods have long, long been skipped as, a, as an important section that needs to be brought up. Okay, and uh, this is an, a sample authentication document, but I believe that Kawe will actually talk to you about how to use DKNet to, to come up with one of these. So I will not um, go through this. And then here is a page of all the resources. And I think I'm assuming that I can just kind of copy this and, and uh, or Koe can provide this to you um, as a set of, of items that, um, that you can go to and uh, find more information about.